Welcome to the Michael Shermer Show. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. My guest today is Peter Ward. His book is The Price of Immortality, The Race to Live Forever. Peter is a British business and technology reporter whose reporting has taken him across the globe. Reporting from Dubai, he covered the energy sector in the Middle East before earning a degree in business journalism from the famous Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. His writing has appeared in Wired, The Atlantic, The Economist, GQ, BBC, Science Focus, and Newsweek. The subject is of considerable interest to me. Of course, I've written about it in my first book, Why People Believe Weird Things. I wrote a whole book about it on uh, recently, Heavens on Earth. And uh, so Peter and I discuss religious immortality, the different versions of living forever that religions have to offer, what it means to live forever. I mean, it's one thing to think, well, maybe I can live 200 years, or 500 years, but forever? How about 500,000 years? What would that be like? I mean, it's inconceivable. So <clears throat> what does that even mean? Okay. Um, we talk about the fact that lives have doubled in length in the last century and why that is, but why things that can't go on forever won't Stein's Law. So there is an upper ceiling. What is that? And how do we break through that upper ceiling? The upper ceiling appears to be about 115 years. Uh, immortalists talk about escape velocity, and they think we're there, or almost there within our lifetime anyway, to reach escape velocity. That is to say, gaining more than one year of longevity every year, and then you get to live forever. And so we talk about the people who uh, actually promote this, not just kooks uh, on the fringes of science, but actually tech billionaires who are pouring a lot of money into this, transhumanists and extropians and cryonicists, nanotechnologists, the brain preservation people, and finally, digital immortality that is uploading your mind into the cloud. The most interesting part about Peter's book is that he actually goes and meets these people and talks to them, so uh, it's fun to hear his stories about what it was like to meet these people and what they're like uh, in person. So with that, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. And as always, if you appreciate the podcast, go to skeptic.com slash donate and support us or just subscribe to Skeptic Magazine. You just join the Skeptic Society and as a benefit of membership, you get uh, a subscription to the magazine. Here's our latest issue, Trans Matters. The next one after this is on uh, Race Matters. So we are dealing with all kinds of uh, socially relevant and hot topics from our own perspective related to science and rationality. All right, thanks for listening, and here's the episode. We're talking about the uh, the kind of mechanics of being frozen, and you have to get to the body fairly soon. The longer you wait, the worse it is. So that that really brings up the question of, you know, what's the definition of death? You know, there is, there's sort of a fluid, uh, fuzzy boundary there that medical doctors have to use, and how do cryonicists think about that? So, yeah, they, they believe that, uh, and most immortalists believe that you're not dead. It, 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 just because your heart stops beating doesn't mean you're dead. Um, they, they believe that's a curable condition, so it's not something that should be so finite, um, which, leads, uh, which leads to all kinds of complications if you actually took that as, as a, a legal definition. Um, for one thing, most people fund their chronics through life insurance, um, which requires you to be declared legally dead before it pays out. And, and in their case, it pays out to the cryonics company to, to pay for their upkeep. Um, but if someone were to be reanimated, that would send loads of questions because maybe the insurance companies would stop paying out at that point because they'd say, well, you never died, so <laughs> we want your money back. It's, it's, it would be a, it's an interesting question. I'm sure insurance companies would find some way to, uh, to not pay um, if there is one. Um, but the, uh, yeah, the chronics people have a, a strange definition of death. Of course, if that all happens cent if that all happens in centuries from now, then probably the insurance company is not even in business anymore. Um, so, yeah, and, and just to clarify that, because a lot of people think this is some sort of rich person's uh, hobby, that in fact you just get a life insurance policy like you would for your spouse or children or whatever, and you pay the annual premiums, a couple hundred bucks, maybe a couple thousand if you're older, and then the payout, the fifty thousand or a hundred thousand or whatever they need, uh, it just is just like it would be paying out to your family. So it's not like you got to give Alcor 
one hundred and twenty thousand bucks now. It's not doesn't work that way, right? Yeah. So you can take one of these life insurance policies out. Obviously, that they're, they're cheaper the younger that you, you do them, and the healthier you are when you get them. Um, so so if you leave it too late, then you're not going to get health uh, life insurance anyway, um, and then you're going to end up having having to pay the full amount to Alcor. Um, but there are plenty of very wealthy people that do it. Um, but some people that, that are not wealthy at, at all and, and still find the money to make these um, monthly life insurance payments. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. So the idea of continuing to live, let's think about that for a second, what that means. So like you mentioned, you know, if you just had a piece of my DNA and you could clone me and you created another Michael Shermer, that wouldn't be me. That would just be a copy of me. So what do I care? Uh, uh, you know, some some copy of me is walking around and, and, you know, that that's not me. And so at least with cryonics, the idea is, you, you know, as you shut your eyes for the last time at, at the moment uh, and then you are reanimated later, your point of view self, your memories, the continuity from one moment to the next continues. You just don't like with general anesthesia, you just have no memory of the time lapse. And instead of a couple hours, it's a couple hundred years or whatever it would be. And you just open your eyes and there you are. It's like, oh, here I am. I'm still here. Yeah, that's that's their idea. That's how they think it would work. Uh, it, it's it's really terrifying if you if you think about it, just waking up, having uh, the last thing you remember is dying and then waking up and you're in a completely, uh, you're in a hundred years time, 200 years time and you, you would have no sort of, you, you'd essentially be a, a, a refugee. Um, you'd, you'd have nothing to connect you to the past. Um, and there are sort of questions as well of what, obviously, what makes us us. Um, and one of the big things, obviously, is memories. Um, and a lot of our memories are linked to things uh, that in our world. So, you know, there's some memories that we have in our, in our brain, which will never be, they're not triggered until there's something, um, something does trigger them. So, you know, if we, if we eat something that we used to eat, uh, when we were younger, it triggers a, a lot of memories. Um, if we see a certain place that we went to as a child, then all, all of a sudden these memories emerge. Um, if you just woke up in, in a future 200 years ago and, and you'd have nothing to, you'd have no no sort of reference point to trigger off those memories and they'd basically be lost forever, not to mention all the people that you'd have lost as well. Um, it's a really terrifying um, proposition if you if you look at it that way. Um, and also, yeah, there is the question of, of some people think that that consciousness is requires continuity. Um, so to have that huge gap, is it still the same person? Um, and and obviously there's the question of of which version of you is it as well. So we're obviously always changing um, who we are, uh, not just you know physically, uh, but also you know our, our brains and our personalities. So do we want you know the eight, the 95 year old version of us to be the one that lives forever or would you prefer to have you know the 21 year old <laughs> version um there's obviously benefits to both but yeah. right right with cryonics you're you're frozen on the worst day of your life yeah <laughs> essentially and, and brought back in that state so i I, I guess their counter to that is, well, well, no, no, no. We have nanotech, and we're going to inject your body with these little nanobots, and they're going to go in there and repair your cells, and and we can make you back to age twenty one again, something like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. So they, they yeah, nanotechnology is always brought up as a, you know, we're going to recreate your body, or we're going to put you in a different body. Um, that's sort of the it, it's the it, it's the sort of like like when you're in in a science fiction film, and there's always something to explain how. How, how it's going to happen. It's, it's always the nanobots, you know, it's nanobots will just solve anything. Don't worry. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the explanation. Um, and to, I mean, th- I mean, it's impossible to disprove Unfortunately, um, nanobots could do amazing things. They're far more likely to lead to our demise. Uh, if, you know, if I'm honest, <laughs> um, if we really, um, invented nanobots, which are capable of doing something like that. Um, but it's uh, yeah. So there's always a sort of answer, and it's not one you can argue with because it's impossible to disprove, but also possible to prove. Um, so it's uh, it's a strange, it, it it's strange engaging in a discussion with someone that's an immortalist because 
they're they're very well versed in topics which are hard to argue down because there's not enough research and scientific backing to disprove them. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's non-falsifiable. It's not part of science, really. It's more science fiction or even religion. I mean, like many of the tenets of religion, you can't test them. You just either accept them or you don't. And that's where this becomes kind of a religion. Yeah, I was thinking about this with the some of the other uh, uh, options on the table that you write about with, um, say, mind uploading uh, or the continuity of your uh, brain. We copy your connectome and upload it to the cloud and turn it on, and there you are. But let's just run through that thought experiment for a second. So let's say I get my brain scanned now. I'm 67. And, and so that's me now, and they turn it on. Well, what if I live another 20 years? That's, that's a different me. I mean, I'm different from moment to moment. I mean, there's kind of a general continuity of who I am, but I'm a different person than I was, say, 30 years ago, and then maybe 50 years ago, and, and so on. So which, which me up there is the real me? Yeah, that's, that's the crucial question. So it's, it's strange. And then even, even if you were uploaded, presumably you, you would still continue changing. Um, so if, if you lived right. in a sort of virtual world for, and presumably you could live there forever, at what point did you just bear no resemblance to the person who was actually alive because you keep changing with the surroundings around you? Um, it's, it's a really interesting question. It's one that I think religion sort of battles with as well, particularly some of the, some of the Eastern religions in terms yeah. of like which version of you gets reincarnated. And, um, you know, there's, it's, it's, a, it's a really strange question um, to ponder. Um, but there's no doubt about it. We can all think about us ourselves when we were 18, when we were 15, when we were, you know, even younger. And it's it's a different person. It's like it's like thinking about a completely different person. I mean, which is a good thing in a lot of cases. Right. So if you're, yeah, yeah. If you're Christian and you die and you ascend to heaven and there you are at the at the feet of Jesus and and and, and God, unless they're the same, that's a different issue. Uh, you know, what's up there? You know, is it is your actual physical body reincarnated also, or is it just your soul, whatever that would be? And what would that be? Just a, a copy of all your memories? Yeah, I think that's what always tripped me up when it came to religion, was this idea of a sort of physical heaven place <laughs> um, that you go to when you die. It's just, uh, I mean, obviously it's physically impossible. There's no way that that could happen, but... Just in terms of like theoretically, what would it look like? How would it, um, how would it work? You would have your <clears throat> your physical body up there. Or would you just be a, a mind floating around, um, doing nothing forever? Um, it's just a really bizarre concept, and it's a it's quite a sort of clumsy answer to to the question, which I think just is always in the back of our minds, which is you know what happens when we die. Um, and religion definitely provides that answer, but if you think about it too much then it, it evaporates. It's no longer an answer. Um, so it's definitely one of those things that just don't think about it too much. Um, you're covered. Let's just say you're going to have a great time when you die. So don't worry about it. Um, as immortalists, I guess, is, is kind of the opposite of that. They, they think this is what you should be thinking about all the time. Let's stop you from dying because we want to carry on. We want to make, uh, and a lot of the religious um, immortalists, because a lot of people who, who are also Christians or, or Jewish who, who are mortalists um, and other religions, um, they, they, they take that religious teaching of going to heaven and say basically immortalism is about creating heaven on earth, like literally. Um, so when they read in the Bible, it says, you know, at one point, um, earth will become heaven and everyone will live forever and it will be great. Um, they believe that it's actually humanity's responsibility to make that happen. Um, so there's an interesting way that you can sort of turn the way, turn what's taught in the Bible and, and sort of tweak it to, to how you feel as an mortalist. Mm. The same psych professor I mentioned earlier, Richard Hardison was his name, who knew James Bedford, the first chronically frozen guy. He used to say, uh, uh, he used to ask, are there golf courses and tennis courts in heaven? Because Otherwise, it sounds boring. You just, what do you do? You just sit there and in and, and bliss? You know, Christopher Hitchens famously called the Christian heaven a celestial North Korea, where you have this dictator that knows everything you're doing and thinking. And and then what? You just sit there? <laughs> it just sounds boring. I mean, the, the things that make life interesting are the challenges. 
So this idea of like this perfect blissful place you go to, that 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 can't be what it is, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think I think that's why that's why as technology has evolved, possibly that's a that's a question that's a reason why we've sort of people are switching off from religion, I think. Um if you sort of believe um Ernest Becker in, in his book Denial of Death, that, that this fear of death is what drives, you know, almost everything we do. Um and that would explain why religion is so popular to start off with. But as as sort of healthcare has got better and our technology has got better and we've started to realize, you know, um, and education has got a lot better, then you start to realize that maybe that doesn't sound so great, that version of everlasting life. Um, and it doesn't quite make sense. So it's, uh, yeah, it's an interesting one. Yeah, and this idea that, um, it's not natural to live forever. I never liked that argument either because, uh, you know, we've had a doubling of the lifespan in the last century due to public health measures and vaccines and things like that. But, you know, according to Stein's law, things that can't go on forever won't, <laughs> right? So even if you double the lifespan on average from 35 to 70 and then maybe we bump it up again to 105 on average, that, that could happen. That seems plausible, and and I would go for that. You know, if you ask me, when, you know, when, when do you, when, how long do you think you should live? I'd probably say something like a hundred something, maybe. Um, but if you got me to the day before that, you know, I'm supposed to check out, and I'm still healthy and happy and living life, I'd go. Well, I'll, I'll take another year, thank you, or maybe another decade would be fine as long as I'm healthy. But but then when you start going out more, like, well, how about another hundred years? Well, I don't know. Gosh, five hundred years, a thousand years. And at this point, I don't even know what we're talking about. And and, and you could say 500,000 years. You can live another 500,000 years, and that's nothing compared to eternity. You know, you know the solar system is four and a half billion years, and even that's, you know, a, a, a fraction of the age of the universe. So when you talk about living forever, it just becomes a ridiculous concept. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if you think about, um, we don't even know that the universe is immortal. Um, we we presume that the universe at some time right. will end, um, and obviously the, at some point the sun will engulf the earth as well. So if you're on this planet, then then you're not going to live forever anyway. You're going to see the end of at the end of planet Earth. Um, so so technically immortality is is completely impossible um, if you take it as as the very um, you know that that strict um, meaning of the word. But I think. Yeah, with these these people, it's more sort of I want to choose when I die. Essentially, um, I think that's their sort of take on immortality. Is I, I want to have the choice of when I die. I want to do it when I want to. Um, a lot of them say, you know, I just want more time. I have so many things I want to do. I I I, I want to get doing them, and I, you know, I, I need more time to do them. Um, and the obvious counter to that is, well, you know, maybe spend a, a bit less time on trying to be immortal and and doing those things, and you you would get more done. But um, it's it's <laughs> yeah, right yeah yeah some of these people i've met i'm sure you met them too is you know it's like they spend so much time thinking about the future it's like you know don't forget to do something today like now <laughs> yeah exactly and also you kind of you can easily make your life extremely miserable chasing immortality it's it's very easy to do you can you know get up and take 60 pills a day um you can starve yourself until um, not eat until 6 p.m. Um, you can take injections. You can fly off and have procedures done in different countries. Um, you can do a lot of things that could potentially make you live longer, but would make you miserable in the short term. So, if they don't work, then you've you've wasted the the short life that you have. And and if they do, then um, you know you've paid a huge price for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not nothing lost. I've met some of these uh, calorie restriction people. They don't look like happy people to me. They're kind of in a state of constant hunger. And they don't look healthy either. No. They look kind of emaciated and pale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, yeah, it's not good. I, I mean, I could never do it. I, I, um, I, I do, uh, from what I, I hear from some gerontologists, there is actually, that's one of the more promising um avenues is is calorie restriction it's just whether you want to put yourself through it um it's it's just grim it's not it's not really enjoying life um uh, apparently you get used to it but like you said like a lot of people that do it they just do not look healthy um and you just worry about what other damage they're doing because 
obviously no one studied the long-term effects of, of any of these things. And that's always the thing that you worry about is the long-term effects. Maybe in the short term, it'll tweak a few biomarkers that would suggest you might live longer. But um, in the long term, you might be doing damage somewhere else in your body, or you might be, um, you know, ruining your chances in, a, in another way. Yeah, because the body is such a complex uh, machine. Tweaking the little variables here or there, when you look through the literature, it's like, well, we got to do this and this and this and this. Yeah, but do you know that if I dial up this, the, these three things here, that 20 years from now, you know, like taking extra testosterone or human growth hormone or any of the doping agents that athletes use. Yeah, but what are the conse long-term consequences? We don't really know. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and genetically, our bodies are completely coded to die. So, I mean, most, uh, as long as we, you could probably figure out, um, you know, the best way to figure out when you're going to die is, is it would be to, to look at uh, your genes and figure out that way if that were possible, because a lot of our deaths are written in our genes. Um, and, and so you could stay, but you could work really hard and stave off anything that's going to give you heart failure, because maybe you think you've got a good chance of dying with heart failure, but something else will get you. Um, at some point, I, you, that's why you sort of you, you hear about all these these people that live to like 120, or you know the oldest people in the world, and they say, oh, you know, I smoke 10 cigarettes a day and I eat like a cheeseburger, um, <laughs> and everyone you know feels really <laughs> yeah. terrible. But it's because their genes, their, their genes um, dictate that they're going to live that long. So it, it really shows that you can do so many things, and it doesn't affect if it doesn't affect them and make them die early. Then it, if we do the opposite. Um, and it's not going to affect us as long as our genes dictate that we're going to die younger than that. Thus, family history is important to physicians when they when they do your general checkup. Um, so obviously, there are things we can do uh, that we should do. You know, don't smoke. Uh, you know, moderate drinking, exercise. You know, nutrition. Uh, you know, moderately healthy. What maybe Mediterranean type diet, something like that. Uh, I mean, what do we know about how to how to kind of tweak the odds up? into your favor to try to get into your, say, 80s or 90s? Yeah, those things that you mentioned, those are, I, I looked into all different crazy ways of trying to improve your, your lifespan. Um, but the one thing everyone always told me is that none of these will do any better than the very simple thing of exercising, eating healthy, um, and having a, trying to have a, a reasonably stress-free life. Um, so I think... Yeah, I mean, eat healthy and exercise. Those are the main things. Um, there's obviously arguments to be said to be take a sort of daily supplement as well. Um, but these are honestly, they're really basic, really boring things that any doctor will tell you to do. Um, and it's it's a really it's really bland, and it's really I think what people really want. I mean, I told people I'm, I'm writing this book. What they want me to do is is then tell them how to live forever. You know, it's <laughs> give them the formula. Yeah. Yeah, and, right. they're, and they're really disappointed when I say, well, you know, maybe just, just exercise more and, and eat, eat some green food, um, and, and that will give you a fighting chance at least. Um, I do think um, medicine is obviously improving and our healthcare is improving a lot, um, and there are some preventative things you can do. You know, there are sort of um, diagnostic things that we can do before to suggest, you know, what we're more prone to, um, so that can definitely help although whether you can completely stave it off is another question maybe you just have something looming over you um but um yeah i think in in right now um just exercise and and eat healthily um that's the only thing that i would i would absolutely suggest someone does what about some of the other kind of fringier things is there any uh evidence for certain supplements like take curcumin or you know you go through ray kurzweil's formula this may be 10 years ago now so i don't know how updated that is today but you know he takes something like 100 supplements a day is there anything to any of those uh not officially no there's there's been there's, so there's research that suggests they work a lot of them and they sort of go in cycles that some of them are popular then others are popular um some people swear by some some people swear by others um uh, essentially, all of the research would suggest that these are going to make you live longer. A lot of it has just been cherry picked. Um, they've they've taken studies that have been done on mice, and and the mice. The, one one thing that someone said to me is, we've never made a mice live beyond its life expectancy. A mouse live beyond its life expectancy. 
Like whenever they say they added so many years to this mouse's lifespan, it's because it was already ill or something, or they just changed a biomarker that could have made it, it live longer. We don't have sort of, there's no 20 year old mice running around because they took a certain supplement um, in a lab. So it's, it's, it's important to be really skeptical about these things because it's so easy. And, and obviously the people in the immortalist crowd that really big up these supplements, um, they're the ones selling the supplements. So it's in their interest for them to, to big up the next big supplement. <laughs> um, right. And you see it all the time. And, right. you know, it's, uh, it is exploitative, I think. Um, and it's, it's not to say that none of them work. Obviously, some of them might work, but there's just no proof that they do work um, at all. Right. So there was that study on possums raised on an island where it, there was no pred- predation and they lived like twice as long as possums that lived, I guess, in Florida somewhere where they just had more accidents, get run over by cars and just more stressful life. But it's not like the possums on the island on the stress-free, you know, predator-free island lived forever. <laughs> they died at their natural kind of upper ceiling. And with humans, that appears to be what, maybe 115 or so, the upper ceiling. And that, you know, this doubling of the human lifespan due to public health measures and vaccines, things like that is just going to get you up higher before, you know, you succumb to something else. So why do we have to die at all? Why didn't evolution design a body with systems that would just keep going on forever? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, uh, obviously, we don't know. Um, We don't know why the body has to die, and we don't know what part of evolution dictates uh, when we die. We don't know why different animals die at different times. So one of the, there's plenty of theories about it. one of the theories is that obviously once you reach a certain age, you're no longer useful. Um, like you, you, so your body is programmed to go through stages where you have children. And then once you've had children, you no longer want to be competing with those children for resources. So that's why nature says, okay, so after you've had your children, it's going to be a gradual decline, then you're going to die. Um, and that, that would be logical in terms of evolution. That would be how different species would, would um, manage resources essentially. So it would just be a resource management thing, death, um, which makes sense uh, in a very sort of clinical way. Um, obviously, if you took, yeah, it's it's not nice to think of, you know, that's why that's why we die just to give more resources to people who are who are younger. Um, but I think that's that was the theory that I I was told that that made the most sense. Um, but there's still a great deal of mystery about it. Right. In the case of humans, maybe to grandparenthood. So maybe you have kids in your, say, in the ancestral environment, maybe in your late teens, early 20s. And then those kids, 20 years later, start having kids. So now you're 40 to 50 something. And then maybe you assist your own offspring to bring up their offspring as grandparents. And that gets you up into your, say, 60s to 70s. But but the next generation, they already have their grandparents so you would be a great grandparent and at this point you're not really adding that much uh, efficiency to the system so natural selection just selects you out and that's pretty much the end yeah yeah you've had your run at that point um uh, with the life expectancy it's worth like bearing in mind that when we say that life expectancy is sort of doubled that's purely because um we've eliminated infant deaths um and, and 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 young children dying like if you took that sort of anomaly out of the data, then you'd find that most people who get sort of beyond 20, they're not living that much longer than like 50 years ago, 100 years ago. It's um, obviously there's, we have better medicine and there's better ways of, of treating each other, but it's not like uh, there weren't 80 year olds around back, you know, back 100 years ago. Um, so that sort of those infant deaths really, um, we've got a much better chance of surviving childhood now. Um, they really sway those numbers. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mentioned Alfred Russell Wallace. He was 91 when he died. Uh, and it, But but the idea is that there's more people living into their 80s mm. and 90s than there used to be uh, because of these public health measures and, and the reduction of inform- infant mortality and so on. Right, so that upper ceiling is probably never going to be uh, broken. But if it was, you take someone like Aubrey de Grey, who you write about, who to me is one of the more fascinating characters in this whole thing. Uh, I think he had, what's his program? He has SENS, S-E-N-S, I think it is. And there's like seven different things. If you solve 
those seven problems, then 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 you'll live forever. Yeah, yeah. He often uses the sort of car analogy of saying, you know, our bodies are like cars. Um, and all you have to do is just, you know, when something breaks down, you fix it. Um, but his his whole thing is a lot about regenerative technologies as well. So he believes that you know we can we have to address these things, and then we can reverse aging. Um, and he and he is the person that sort of brought in this escape um, velocity uh, in longevity, so longevity escape velocity theory, which is really what drives so many immortalists to do these things that will make them live even a tiny bit longer. Because he believes if you catch that wave of um, of of technology, which will live. So he, he thinks in about 20, 30 years, we'll have the first wave where you'll be able to live an extra 20 years. And so and if you if within those 20 years, there'll be something that make you that will allow you to live another 50 years. And then it will go on and on and on. And, and you'll just uh, once you've hit that escape uh, velocity, then you, you can live for as long as you choose. Um, yeah, but he's a hugely polarizing character, um, <clears throat> even within even within the immortalists, I think. Uh, I mean, he's hero worshipped by a lot of them. He is sort of um, uh, he is sort of the almost a de facto leader of the entire immortalist movement. Um, he's the one person that who's sort of faced up against the science industry uh, as, as the scientists and kind of been proven right with some of his theories about regeneration. Um, and he. Uh, uh, and so they love him for it. And and he's never shy to say we, we can live forever and we should beat death and we should be aging. And he's almost militant about it. Um, so yeah, really fascinating guy. Um, a very, very carefully crafted image. Um, there's, there's a reason why his beard is so long and like Rasputin and he, and he talks in the way he talks. Um, he, he knows exactly what he's doing and he knows exactly what to say to get the right publicity because he believes completely in his cause um and uh and, and he does that uh you know really um really effectively yeah i think it was at that singularity institute conference that i met aubrey de gray you know and i noticed uh he drank a lot of beer <laughs> i thought is this on the uh, formula for <laughs> yeah because <laughs> i like beer so that wouldn't be too bad <laughs> yeah he he drinks beer all times of the day famously um, so when I interviewed him, I think it was about, it was, it was in the morning, California time. Um, and he cracked open a beer, um, while we were talking, um, uh, he, he, so he, he, he believes that so much in regeneration and, and that we'll be able to regenerate the body and fix it like, a, uh, and sort of replace parts that there's no, he doesn't take supplements like other, um, immortalists and he doesn't appear to do a lot of the things that they do because, uh, um, he he just believes everything can be fixed essentially. Hmm. Right. So uh, and let's go over those seven stages because I I do wonder if there's more. He just said, okay, here here are the seven things, if I recall correctly, that if you fix those, we can regenerate cells. So one of them was telomeres, right? Things that you could do to keep the telomeres from snapping off. So just kind of go through the what are telomeres and 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 what do they have to do with aging and how could could you possibly uh, reverse that yeah so t- tell me is the best described as as the kind of the the end bit of a shoelace the little plastic bit that would be the telomere on the cell so they they kind of protect it from fraying um and so there's a there's a theory that telomeres when they get shorter that that becomes a problem essentially so you you want to keep your telomeres as long as possible um but then research suggested that telomeres maybe shouldn't be too long um and then other research said, you know, there's different types of telomeres, so it's not as as um, clear cut as people think. Um, so telomeres is a sort of classic area where it became really a buzzword in longevity, and everyone wanted to do telomeres, and people started bringing out these telomere length tests um, where you could, you know, have your telomeres measured. Um, but it was all got really dumbed down and simplified, um, and. Uh, and the science, the science wasn't complete. The, the the research into telomeres wasn't complete. There was still there was still a lot to be found out, and they're still finding out new things about telomeres. Um, but yeah, that's 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 one of them. That's one of the seven. Um, yeah, the telomere length. Right. What are some of the others? Um, yeah. So there's. Um, let me just try and remember. <laughs> um, I think what 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 wasn't one of them? Um, to what extent debris piles up in your cells? 
and then your cells can uh, get rid of the debris, cleaning it out, and that slows down with age. So you need to kind of jumpstart that. Yeah. So there's there's a lot about inflammation. Free radicals, yeah, right? Free radicals, about free yeah. radicals. Uh, and that sort of causes inflammation and causes our bodies to feel old, essentially. Um, uh, mm. There's also mm. obviously the uh, it's sort of linked to the senescent cells, which is the sort of zombie cells. So when cells um, reach the end of their lives, they become senescent, um, and they so they stay in the body and they secrete these proteins, um, which then affect things around them. Um, but they uh, but they're dead. They're not serving really any purpose as far as we know. So that was another thing that everyone jumps on. We have to kill all senes- get rid of all the senescent cells, and that would that will help us. Um, but then there was other research that suggested senescent cells actually have. Um, anti-cancer properties so they help uh there's a reason why they your cells become senescent and why you need senescent cells is because they stop cancer um they stop them becoming cancerous um so that was another thing so some of the most promising research is in senescence and and senescent cells um and particularly senolytics which is is stopping that secretion so senescent cells would still be there but they wouldn't secrete those proteins which would damage tissue uh, around them and and that's really promising, because um, it is also worth saying that some of the anti aging um, research is really really promising, um, and they and they don't have the goal of living forever or even living for longer, they just want to slow the effects of aging so we are um, essentially so we're ill for less time so we're we're, we're not sick um, for twenty years then we die we're sick for a year and then we die, um, or we're sick for you know a, a couple of weeks and then we die. Um, and, and senescence is where there's some really fascinating research and a lot of money being poured into that. I like that idea a lot. Just, just try to get me to say 90 and, you know, and I feel great, you know, for 89.9, uh, years of that, of that lifespan. And then like a, the little ever ready battery just goes, whoop, you know, in, 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 at, the, at the very end. Yeah, definitely. And, and so they, they, so that's the pursuit of health span. So there's two two things, lifespan and health span. So if you're pursuing lifespan, then you're just trying to live longer no matter what. Um, health span is just trying to increase the number of healthy years that you have. Um, and, and yeah, so if you, if you did, so a lot of people in, in aging research believe that aging should be treated as a disease, um, not as um, uh, just some mysterious thing. So um, the, the, obviously the, the idea is that if you could treat aging and if you could stop some of the aging processes or slow them down, then you would then dramatically reduce instances of cancer and heart disease, which are all things that result because of aging. Um, so as we get older, you're going to get one of those things, which is why so many people die of heart disease or cancer um, and things like that. But if they're sort of, it, when you reach a certain point, one of them is going to get you. So it might say on your death certificate that you died of, of, of heart failure, but actually you may, you know, it was, it was just, growing old um this aging just reduced your body to the status where that heart disease was definitely going to kill you right right like the, the the kind of increase in alzheimer's and dementia it's not really that it increases it's just that most people died earlier before that kicked in and so now people are living longer because of other health measures and now they're getting taken out by something else yeah absolutely so it's um yeah, so it makes you worry if we did go to 150, what what would, you know, what disease would get us at that point? You know, um, there was one. Yeah, there was one guy, uh, an aging scientist, and someone. He, he had a great story. He said, you know, someone once asked um, uh, a colleague of mine, you know, what would happen if we cured heart disease, uh, and he said, well, we'd have a bunch of old people uh, walking around uh, who'd lost their minds, um, and that would be. <laughs> <laughs> he was saying essentially mm-hmm. that, you know, they wouldn't have died of a heart attack, but they'd all have got Alzheimer's or something or, or dementia. So you'd have a huge problem on your hands. Um, so, uh, but the idea is if you can, if you can attack aging, then you could also reduce dementia and, and, and Alzheimer's, which are obviously like horrendous diseases, which, which would be really beneficial for, for the whole of humanity. Yeah. What's the state of research on what you could do about that? You know, there was those, uh, stories about you know doing Sudoku puzzles and and and, and taking courses and in, in your older age to keep your mind sharp and playing chess and I don't know what, um, but I, I think those largely fail to replicate as well, right? 
Yeah, yeah. I think um, it's still there's still a lot to be done in terms of research on what when it starts happening. What, what there, there there are some of the things that Aubrey de Grey brought up, which potentially um, contribute to Alzheimer's and increase your chances greatly of having Alzheimer's. So then, obviously, a lot of people start doing those. You know, um, if there's something that there's a sort of anti-cancer drug that potentially has um, uh, can stop senescence of uh, can, can stop damage of, of senescent cells. And so people take a lot of those, even though they don't have cancer. Um, but yeah, with Alzheimer's, it's, it's, I mean, it's obviously a terrible disease, but it's, it's really hard to, I, I think they've found it difficult. And you, you see all these studies come out and they seem really promising. And I think that's a frustrating thing that you do see these headlines, which are sometimes exaggerated, suggest that a cure is on the horizon. Whereas, you know, all they've done is, is done something in a mouse. Um, which may potentially, and it's still sort of 10 years off a clinical trial um, and even further off being actually used. So it can be sort of frustrating when you see these things, but I don't, yeah, I, I seem to remember reading something that it doesn't do as much as you think it does doing sort of these puzzles. Um, it's, it's not as, it's not as uh, beneficial as, as you might think. Um, yeah. Yeah. I met uh, Rudy Tanzi from Harvard at, uh, at one of Deepak Chopra's conferences. And you know, he's like one of the world's leading experts on Alzheimer's and genetics and so on. And even he said, well, you know, we're a long, long ways from figuring this out. You know, they have a couple of the genome sequences that are related to it. And, you know, when you do the 23andMe or one of the online uh, uh, gene sequencing companies, you know, and they, uh, you can tick the box. I'd like to know if I have the Alzheimer's genes. But when you actually read the fine print, all they're saying is, well, these are two we know that are kind of remotely related to Alzheimer's. And if you have these, it may increase your chance of getting Alzheimer's by like 1% or something. It was some nothing. It was like, okay, well, so I, and I ticked the box. I don't have them. So, so I thought, oh, good. I'm not going to get Alzheimer's. But when I read the fine print, it's like, oh, I, I may still get Alzheimer's. It's just yeah. slightly lower, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all these sort of diagnostic things are becoming more popular, you know, finding out more and more about your body, like how biologically old it is and things like that. Um, and it comes back to sort of age old question, like, would you want to know the day that you die? Um, what would that do to your to the way you approach life? Would it just mess you up? And would you end up just dreading this day? Or would it somehow yeah. spur you on? Um, or would you try and stop it? Um, so yeah, that's an interesting. What would you do? Uh, if someone told me the way, the day, the exact day I was going to die, um, would you want to know? I wouldn't want to know. No, I, I would, I would much prefer to be completely yeah, oblivious. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I, me too. I, I think it would just, there's, there's nothing positive going to come out of that. Um, even if you could potentially change it, um, I'd rather it just, you know, come at me from nowhere, which I hope I'm not tempting fate now, but <laughs> <laughs> I do like the general idea, though, that there's some probabilities. Like uh, in my family, uh, my father died at age 61 of a heart attack. One of his brothers died early 60s of a heart attack. Their father died, my grandfather, of a heart attack in early 60s. So I thought, well, you know, knowing that, I'm going to really, uh, I knew this in my 20s, and it's like, okay, I'm going to really exercise. It's just a few things you could do, eat a reasonably healthy diet. I'm not fanatical about it, and work out every day, and you know, I don't smoke and just, just kind of general stuff. But I wouldn't want to know that, you know, at, when you're 72 and a half on Tuesday afternoon on August 27th, you're going to have your heart attack. I, I would not want to know that. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, I just don't think that that could help you because if, if someone's giving you that much certainty, then surely there's not much you can do about it. You would, you know, there's no, there's no exercise right. that you could do in the world that would, uh, it would stop you. I guess the one upside would be you could do all kinds of outrageous things up until 72 and a half, knowing that, that you're probably not going to die from it. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's an interesting thought experiment. Bucket list stuff, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. What do the immortalists say to arguments like it, it's not natural to live longer or overpopulation of the planet would be terrible or if you lived a thousand years, you'd have so many marriages and careers and jobs and all kinds of stuff like that, that, that you know, we're not really designed to, to deal with. Yeah, these are the questions that they really do not like. Um, so Aubrey de Grey, for example, has publicly said he's stopped answering those questions. Um, he won't, he, he doesn't even deem them worthy of, of, uh, of attention. He says, now, you know, 
now is not the time to start thinking about, you know, overpopulation. We've addressed those concerns and now we just need to cure aging. Um, uh, but they obviously, they are still questions no matter how much you, you want to ignore them. Uh, on the overpopulation side, they believe that with the technology that is, is making us, um, that would make us live longer, other technologies would, would move alongside that. So we'd be better at, at resource collection and um, a lot of people point to space travel as that we would go out and, and have um, different places to live in, in the in the universe and the solar system. Um, so that's a kind of, it's another big leap of faith again uh, it's, as to how to explain that that issue. Um, but the, the, the sort of, I think the, the thing that always comes back that makes the most sense to me when they when they make these arguments for why we this will happen regardless of those concerns is is that we've always tried to keep people alive no matter what um you know doctors are sworn to try and keep people alive as, as long as possible um we have a very sort of small number of people that that go through euthanasia or or do not resuscitate everyone has always tried to try to stay alive as long as possible there's something within us that wants to keep alive so if these technologies that they say are coming do arrive, then there's an ethical question, you know, saying that we are duty bound to use them um, and have as many people as possible live for as long as possible. So, this, so that sort of renders that question of should we do this kind of, kind of a mute point because um, according to them, it's going to happen. And, and, and as soon as these technologies are available, we have to use them because we can't just let people die who, who could otherwise live because we see that as sort of the, uh, a terrible thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, when I'm asked, you know, would you want to live 500 years or 1,000 years, my answer is, I don't know, just get me to 80 and then I'll see how it goes there. You know, just solve this one little problem. You know, prost- I'm a guy, prostate cancer. Okay, just solve that one, yeah. okay? And then maybe dementia and then Alzheimer's and then, you know, this or heart disease, you know, just one at a time. And don't worry about the 500 years thing. I mean, I don't even know what that would mean. I mean, like, I'm on my 27th marriage and I'm starting my 15th career. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, like, I don't even, can't even conceive of yeah. these things. And, and obviously all this assumes that we would be living in a world that we'd want to live forever. In. Um, and and the, it's, it's a very idealistic view of the world. Um, because a lot of these people that think about this are in a very sort of privileged state. They don't sort of live in any kind of discomfort on the whole. Um, they don't usually live in poverty. They don't live um, in, in, a, in a war zone. Um, whereas if you asked sort of the majority of people on, on the earth, you know, would you want to continue in the life that you are now for a thousand years? Um, unfortunately, a lot of people I'm sure would be hor- horrified by the idea um, just because life is hard for a lot of people. Um, and then when they say, I want to live for 500 years, I don't think they realize how quickly things could change. Um, and all of a sudden they could be in a position where they don't want to be alive because maybe, you know, climate change has ravaged the earth to the point where we're all underwater or, uh, um, you know, war, nuclear war is broken out and, 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 and the whole planet is destroyed. It's, um, there's a lot of things that you don't take into account when you say you want to live for a very long time because, is it as depressing as it sounds? It might not be a world that you want to live in anyway. Yeah, right. Exactly. But let's just try to make tomorrow slightly better than today, and just <laughs> just go one day at a time. Yeah. You know, there, but there, but you know that that kind of appeal, that almost science fiction appeal. Let's imagine ten thousand years from now. I mean, it's fun, I guess, but realistically, you know, what are you going to do with that? Okay, the Brain Preservation Prize. I'm on their committee, and you wrote about that. You know, their idea. Uh, they kind of brought me on as the token skeptic, I guess, uh, because I'm, I don't think they're going to achieve what they think they're going to achieve. But here the idea is that the, the, your memory self, that, that's the key to selfhood. That's who you are, your collection of memories. And let me see if I remember their arguments right. So like when you are, uh, have like a, a, a bypass surgery or some major surgery and they chill the body down, way down into the 30 degrees, something above freezing, just for the surgical purposes, your brain is essentially shut off. Mm. Uh, not not just general anesthesia shut off, but but really cold. So there's very little molecular activity between the neurons. But when they warm you back up, the memories come back online. So the memories uh, are stored in there in a physical state between the synapses. 
and they have these you know micro th these um, you know scanning microscopes where they can see the actual uh, synaptic connections between neurons. And their argument is that those are permanently wired together. You know, they fire together, they wire together, and all that, such that if we froze your brain and then chilled it, you know, warmed it back up, those physical connections would still be there. And therefore, that's the, the sense of continuity going forward into the future. And even then, the next step would be scanning every single synaptic connection in a giant computer uh, and then turning it on. The, the, that would be you. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah, it's um, so it's slightly less ambitious, I guess, than cryonics in that um, they're, not, they're not saying that they're keeping everything that is a person alive and they're not saying even that they're going to reanimate it. Um, the one person that, that I, I spoke to um, uh, from Nectome, a company called Nectome, um, he sort of compared what he was doing to essentially making a library. Um, and he believed this would, is the next, the sort of next generation of, of, of how we pass on our memories and our knowledge from, from one generation to the next. Um, so he, he, you know, obviously we, we've wrote, written stuff down and, and there's word of mouth and we wrote stuff down. Now we have computers. So the next sort of stage of that is to, is to just store brains as if, uh, you'd have a library of memories, um, which would then be accessed by, by other people. Um, so that, I mean, that's, that's not, as far as I can say, a crazy idea. It's, there's a strong likelihood that no one will ever figure out a way to read what's on those brains. Um, it's not like he's he's writing a book. This is he's he's preserving something which is insanely complicated. Um, it, his his sort of argument is yeah. There, I mean, there must be a way of doing it because we can do it uh, as as human. There is a machine that does it. It's, you know, the brain can you know uh, decipher what is in a, in our memories. Um, again, it's a it's a massive long shot, um, and it, and. The argument with the with the free with brains, you know, people dying on the operating table technically, and, and their brains being chilled. There's also, I guess, people falling into icy lakes and then being re uh, resuscitated. Um, does suggest that there is some kind of memory, the physical um, remnants of, you know, phys it's a physical thing somehow. Our memories. Um, so he he had a very compelling argument, um, uh, and I think. Um, yeah, I find I found that really interesting. Like just that that, that possibility, um, this idea of being able to at least store someone's memories as some kind of archive. Um, but again, it's it's just a massive long shot. Um, you know, we we can we can sort of map. We can't we can't even map the entire human brain. We can't even reverse engineer the human brain at the moment. There's so much we can't do with the brain because there's just too much going on. It's still like the most powerful. Um, you know, instrument in the world is the human brain, essentially. So much is going on at the same time. Um, to even take like a snapshot of what's going on in the brain would take, you know, absolutely years to do. Um, that, again, you're sort of relying on, on on a leap in technology, which is almost sort of miraculous, um, a, a kind of singularity event, essentially. Um, and it all comes back to that sort of singularity um, type jump and then an exponential curve of technology. Um, but if you do believe in a, in a, in an advancement of technology on an exponential curve, then, then sort of anything is possible at that point, because, um, you know, that is, that, that, that is serious progress, obviously over a very short amount of time. I think people struggle to get their heads around the concept of exponential curves. Um, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen. It's, it's, it's waiting for that one event. Like you said, it's almost, you know, like religion, it's, it's that one event that will happen in your lifetime. And once it does, all our problems are solved. Um, so, right, right, and then a miracle happens. You know, I think you need to be more specific in step two here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the singularity is going to solve it all, and, and and back to where we began with the you know the space exploration people. It all gets kind of wrapped up into that. We're going to have energy too cheap to meter. We're going to have fusion, and we're going to be colonizing the galaxy, and all these things are kind of thrown into the pie like this is our future 
And it is kind of fun to think about that stuff, but I don't know how realistic it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely fun. It's great. It makes great for great movies and great books. Um, I think that's why we're drawn to the certain, certain types of movies and books. But, you know, there's one guy um, who's in Russia, actually, who, who wrote a paper about um, mind uploading. And he went through all the different possibilities of digital immortality um, and decided that it w- we actually would need, if we want to resurrect everyone, would be a, a, an AI the size of a planet, <laughs> um, like an artificial intelligence. Uh, and it would require um, one of those... Um, I forget the name of them, the things that basically draw on the power of an entire sun um, for energy to, to power it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Dyson Sphere, I think like it's called. Like a Dyson Sphere. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, but then he had this sort of caveat at the end. It's just, a, it was almost like a, a, a side note. It was a, by the way, this AI doesn't, cannot turn evil, essentially. Um, so he's saying, you know, we have to have all this to happen. <laughs> yes, right. But, there's still the chance that the AI t- decides, you know, to wipe out humanity and, and the Terminator movies start or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, mm-hmm. Right, yeah. right. There was that Johnny Depp movie. Uh, was it Transcendent Man? Or Transcendence, tra- Transcendence, yeah. I forget the name of the movie where, yeah, Transcendence, right, where he's a computer AI scientist and he gets, I forget, poisoned with radioactive something or from terrorists and he uploads his mind to the computer and then he dies and then... You know, he's right there. You know, you could just kind of go, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he's in there looking out at the world. And I, to me, that that can't that won't happen, not even in principle. So tell me what you think about this argument, because they, they don't like this argument, that uh, the self is your point of view self through your eyes from one moment to the next. And maybe the cryonics thing would work if the break was instead of minutes or hours, it was, you know, 100 years or whatever. But I didn't know the difference. I open my eyes and still me. Um, but the mind uploading, that's just a copy that goes up to the cloud and you turn it on because what if I didn't die? What if you just scanned my brain in a super sophisticated MRI and and then you slid me out and I'm standing there and they go, okay, you're up in the cloud now. It's like, no, I'm not. I'm right here. Yeah. It, I don't know who that is. That's just a copy of me. That's not me. And, and their counter to that is, well, but that... Michael Shermer also thinks he's Michael. So now there's two. So the self would have to be redefined. It could be his n n number of cells, something like that. Yeah, yeah. It's that, that, yeah. That's where things sort of start to break down a little bit in, in the in the theories because um, yeah, you 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 wouldn't you would still die you, as you know yourself now would die. So just because some other entity with everything identical about you booted up after you died, that wouldn't be you wouldn't feel it. Um, you wouldn't feel it at all. And that's not, and that's not even considering sort of what potentially could happen. Like someone could take your digital self and torture it for the whole of eternity. Um, <laughs> Forever. Or put it to work or, <laughs> you know, do terrible things to it. And, and you'd be thinking, oh, well, it's not me. Um, so it's, it's a really fascinating question. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, I don't know if you saw the Apple TV show uh severance recently um it's really mm-hmm. worth watching no, what, it's, tell us about that. it's uh it's so there's the basic concept is that there's a, a future technology company and the employees are offered a a procedure called severance where their brains uh their work brains are separated from their at home brains so when they go to work they don't remember anything about themselves when they're at home and when they come home from work they don't remember anything that happened at work and it essentially creates two different people. Um, but, uh, and so it, it sounds like a really cool idea to start off with, but then, but then what they essentially did is create a different person, a whole new person, this childlike person who was just at work all day, every day, and was just tortured with work and didn't do anything interesting. Um, and, and the other person who made this choice to them um, was just completely oblivious to how much um, pain this this other being, which is inside their own head, um, was in. So yeah, it's a fascinating concept. And I think that those kind of things are always always really fascinating to me. But um, it kind of works here as well. Like, would you you'd create another version of yourself? Um, and how responsible would you be for that for that being? Um, like, you wouldn't feel their pain, but it it would be strange to imagine a version of yourself. Um, constantly in limbo, for example, or, or just not, uh, or, or being made to do something 
Um, it's really strange. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like virtual reality. I don't, I don't know if you encountered uh, Frank Tipler's book, The Physics of Immortality. In your research, this was a big book in the 90s. I think it was 96 or 97. And uh, so I got to know Frank. I wrote about him. I brought him to Caltech to give a, a lecture about it. And, um, you know, and he's a super smart guy. It's all dependent on physics and all this stuff. And the, again, it's a Kurzweil type doubling of computing power. If you carry this out, eventually we'll have a, a super AI large enough to, uh, to replicate in a virtual reality everyone who ever lived or even could have lived. So you'd, you'd have trillions of people, but that's okay because it only has to be you that, that you know you're one of those that replicated. It doesn't matter how many there are of you, as long as it's you know sort of your, through your eyes replicated person, and that uh, and then he just carries this all the way out to this omega point far future computer is essentially God, mm. and it turns out he's a Christian and he thinks this is what the Bible and Christianity is actually saying, is that the far future. Omega point is Yahweh, that is God, and that he will want to do this, replicate everybody. Well, so Hitler's also replicated, but how does that work? You know, and how do we punish Hitler for what he did, you know, in some far future universe? Anyway, he deals with all that stuff. But it, my sense at some point is like, this is really, this is science, this is physics. I mean, it feels like a Star Trek episode to me. Yeah. Yeah. It quickly gets into that territory. Uh, I mean, it, no matter where you go with immortality, you, you always draw back to say, oh, I've seen that in that film or I've seen that in that TV show. Um, and its it, I don't think it's any coincidence that all of them never end well. The people involved, is, you never see any, any TV show or, or film where they, they all live forever, happily ever after. Um, someone always dies at the end or it's always turns out to be a dreadful idea. Um but yeah, it's 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 weird because it uh, and another issue is that it is multidisciplinary. It's not something that you could attack. Uh, I think with just biology, for example, it's also a philosophical question and it's a physics question. And it's um, so if it were to happen, it would definitely need a lot more people engaged in it than there are now. I think um, because at the moment it's not mm -hmm. it's not the best and the brightest. I think that's fair to say. Um, uh, and they even have an argument for that. They say, <laughs> they, they, they have an argument for that saying, you know, that n all these researchers aren't allowed to say that immortality is possible because then they'll lose their funding. So, um, so Aubrey de Grey oh. claims that <clears throat> he speaks to all these aging scientists and they all agree with him that immortality could be possible and that uh, we can live until we're 200, 500 or, or whatever. Um, but they don't dare say it in public. Uh, and because the all their grants will disappear overnight, um, which is a sort of ingenious argument because you can't argue with that. Um, like, how do you? Uh, this is this is the conspiracy. Th this is the conspiracy theory that big pharma and and big medicine wants us to die, age, and die and suffer so they can make more money. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of that as well. And and so you sort of you speak to these aging people and say, oh, what do you think about Audrey, Aubrey de Grey? And they say he's a crackpot. He's he's you know he's crazy I, he's not a scientist and nothing he says is right and then you go to him and you say well these people say you're a crackpot and he's got a ready a ready baked reason for them saying that so well I actually really like that person and they they only say that because they have to distance themselves from me and that's absolutely fine um so yeah it, it can become hard to to uh to get past some of these arguments yeah, and then you, you you get into the whole um are we are we living in a simulation once you go down the road of you know, computer doubling power and so on and so forth. And if we can create a virtual reality that's indistinguishable from the world we live in now, which is, you know, if you carry out the Kurzweilian doubling curves and so on, we we're going to get there at some point. I just had David Chalmers on the podcast. He has a 500 page book arguing that this is all possible and here's how the ethics will work out and you know, all the philosophical issues that philosophers talk about it, it, as if they applied into this virtual world. But it, but he says right in there, there's no way to test this. It, it, it isn't possible to know because you, you are we living in a, a virtual reality right now? Well, I don't know. If if there's no way to tell, how would I know? Yeah. You know, unless it was a like a Star Trek holodeck where you say computer and program. And then if nothing happens, does that mean this is the actual real world? Yeah. Uh, another, I think, um, important question is, would we want to know? Like, can you imagine what we would do to society if we found out we, with definitive proof that this was right. all a simulation? Um, 
it would be sort of end of day stuff. People would be, you know, going crazy. It would, right. it would, it would make you lose your mind, uh, not knowing what, you know, thinking that this is all for nothing in some way. Um, yeah, because I've I've seen I don't know if you saw the paper about um, the the, uh, the the Fermi paradox and why we haven't found aliens and and one of the more recent theories is that because when a civilization reaches a certain point, it doesn't go out into the universe; it goes into a virtual reality instead. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things that's that's brought up a lot. Um, and and yeah, it's one of those things that that sort of plays with the mind a lot it's an interesting thought experiment but like you said it's it's not provable and and would you even want to prove it even if you could yeah no well first of all n- not all the aliens are going to want to just be uh with their headsets on living in virtual reality surely some of them will want to explore the actual physical universe okay what well, what if that's all a replication you know again how do you know i don't know one of my favorite star trek episodes the next generation is called ship in a bottle have you seen this one where they're in the holodeck playing out a, um, uh, a, uh, a, a scenario with uh, Sherlock Holmes. And his arch rival, Moriarty, is one of their characters that, that they've run a lot of programs on. Well, in this particular episode, he actually exits the holodeck into the Enterprise. Yeah. And they're all standing there going, that's not possible. He can't be out there. Because he can only exist in here, right? So much of the episode is them trying to figure out how they're going to get him back in. And he doesn't he doesn't want to go back in. He wants to live in the physical world. And who cares why this happened? But here I am. And uh, and he has this love interest. And he wants to bring her into the Enterprise out of the holodeck so he, can, he and she can, you know, live a, a physical life and so on. And then at the very end, uh, one of the characters realizes that one of the other characters in 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 the Star Trek crew is now left-handed rather than right-handed and he realizes oh this is all part of the replication we're still in the holodeck yeah. <laughs> we're not in the enterprise the enterprise is just a replication in the holodeck and then it ends when they then they kind of speculate what if everything we've been doing is just another holodeck on somebody else's yeah. you know virtual reality and then, and then they, you know, they show this little box, and that Moriarty and his sweetheart are in the box, traversing the entire universe, exploring it in their spaceship in that little box <laughs> forever. And then the the, the the character here that that they're tracking, he, you know, he he walk, he kind of stops and says, "Computer and program." And he's like, <laughs> <laughs> "This is, you know, the, the the virtual reality has to sit in a computer somewhere. Yeah. So there has to be an actual hardware computer." however many generations of virtual realities there are, there has to be one of them that's actually real. Yeah, yeah. and it really sort of plays with your mind. I think it's very easy for people to sort of go down the conspiracy theory route as soon as they sort of accept that as a possibility because all of a sudden, so, you know, all these strange things that they can't explain is oh, there's someone tampering with the, with, the, um, with the virtual reality program we're in or, you know, someone's throwing a curveball into the simulation. Um so yeah, it's it's uh, I find it really fascinating thought experience and you know some uh, thought experiment to to think about. But I think when people take it a little bit too too seriously, um, it, it does send them down that sort of rabbit mm-hmm. hole of conspiracy theories, doesn't it? My rebuttal to this is that if we were living in a virtual reality, occasionally you would see some kind of glitch, like a little buffering. Like earlier, we had, we had tech issues. But if you and I were in the same room and all of a sudden you blinked out and, you know, oh, he's gone. Yeah. <laughs> and then you come back in with a little buffering. Sense, it's like, OK, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is too weird. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, but then you have the people that say, oh, there are these these things do happen. And, you know, the glitches in the Matrix, you know, and, and, and they point to things like these unexplained flying objects and things like that. Um, so I think it can you can easily uh, can easily fall down that 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 route. Um but yeah, there are there are there's a good yeah. reason to suggest we're not in a simulation. But I think an even better reason to not believe we're in a simulation uh, and just sort of get on with things. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, Peter, we're coming up at about an hour and a half here in our conversation. Let me just kind of wrap things up with talking about the psychology of death and immortality and beliefs in it. I mean, on, on the one hand, if I ask you to picture yourself dead, you can't do it because to picture yourself anywhere you have to be alive and sentient so i think one of the drivers of belief in 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 afterlife or the continuation of life is you just can't literally can't imagine not being 
sentient and, and aware. Because to imagine that, you have to be sentient and aware. So, you know, Ernst Becker has this idea you talk about in the book of this kind of fear of that, um, the fact that we can imagine that and then imagine it ending somehow, even if we can't picture what that would look like. And that's what spurs human creativity and, 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 and drives us to be better people and civilization. And he kind of attributes much of humanity to this awareness that we're going to die, that we're mortal. What do you think about that? And kind of recap it yourself and, and give us your thoughts on that. Yeah. So the the way I interpret it is is essentially him saying that we, it's it's a it's a blessing and a, and a curse that we're aware of our own mortality so much um, that we have these sort of overdeveloped brains which can imagine ourselves anywhere uh, and can imagine our demise and can imagine us um, doing amazing things, but they're housed in these bodies which are destined just to decay right in front of us. And, and that obviously, um, you know, ha- having that, that knowledge that we're going to die, I think does spur us on to do, to do things. It, it creates a purpose in our life beyond what evolution tells us to do. You know, we want to achieve things. We want to leave something behind a legacy. Um, and, and, and so obviously it, I think death does bring meaning to life. Um, and if you compare us to sort of the, the animal world where, you know, the, the, there's an instinct to survive, but there's not no real, as far as we know, appreciation of death. Um, uh, then you can see, in some ways, that's you know that makes us very jealous that you know we don't have to think about it. It's just a thing that happens, and, and we don't even have the capacity to to uh, appreciate it. Um, but in another way, maybe that's why humans are capable of, of you know, amazing pieces of art, of writing great poetry and, and literature. Um, maybe death is a thing that 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 allows us, um, and, and knowing our own mortality, allows us to do some of the best things that human humanity can do. Um, it certainly, um, you know, we we thought of amazing and and inventive ways to to kill each other, um, which is the downside of it. Um, but but also the knowledge that that we're on a we're in a finite um, we we have a set time here on Earth. Even if you believe in heaven, you, we still know that there's some kind of you'd still believe there's some kind of transformative process at the end of our lives. Uh, gives us that sort of urgency to to go on and do something, and 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 ideally should motivate us. And I think this is the best way of looking at it. Should motivate us of, of to leave this Earth better than when we came into it. And, and to enjoy ourselves while we're here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the heyday of teaching chimps sign language, uh, there was a, a, a funny meme going about it. It's like, I hope they don't start signing that they've they found out that they're mortal. <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> with the signs, you know, we're all going to die. What? <laughs> <laughs> and, then that, and then that drives them to culture. <laughs> yeah. No, it's interesting because if you've seen in nature, obviously, you know, animals, are, uh, some animals are really well equipped for death, like there's some animals that go into like shock as soon as I don't know, a, a predator's teeth clamp down on them. Um, so they're, they're, they're really well equipped to deal with death to the point where they know when it's coming and they shut down so there's no pain. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there is something to be, you know, to be jealous of that, that they don't have to ever consider that they're going to die. Um, but then, and also even worse, I guess, is that they don't have to consider that their, their family and friends are going to die, which I think is the most cruel aspect of death is mm-hmm. not knowing that you're going to die, but, but knowing that, yeah. that people around you will. Right, right. But all the more reason then to appreciate every single day. My dog appreciates every day, but he doesn't even think about tomorrow, I'm sure, other than I hope I get fed and get to go for my walk. <laughs> but he doesn't think I'm going to, you know, his, his master me is going to die one day and that is his fellow buddy dogs are going to die. I mean, that, that's a, that's a burden that maybe, you know, that we don't want to carry, but we do by, by the virtue of the fact that we are aware of it. And there's good that comes out of that. Namely that if you know, there's an end coming at some point, I don't want to know when, but there's kind of a, a terminus to this lifespan. So I should make the most of what I'm doing in my thirties and forties and fifties and have children and create a life for them so that they can, go through the process like I did and that maybe I write some more books because that's part of my legacy and, and so on. And and, uh, maybe someday I'll retire and then I'm going to do this or that. If you didn't have that, 
it, it would change how you think about each of your decade of your life. Yeah, you, you, I mean, procrastination to start off with would be off the charts. Like, like why, <laughs> why would I, <laughs> yeah. why would I read this book today? Uh, like, why would I study this topic? Why would I, why would I finish this painting or, or finish this book? I've got the whole of eternity to do it in, um, and and the clock's not not really ticking. Like, I, I just can't imagine what the world would be like. It would be just a complete you'd be hard pushed to start off with to get anyone to do any kind of job that wasn't extremely entertaining. Like no menial job would be, would be possible because, um, if you weren't going to die, then what would be the point in doing it? Um, so it, yeah, it's, it's a completely different world. I think it's a completely different species. If you eliminate death, I think we become something that's not human. Um, I think death is a really crucial part of the human condition. Um, and, and, uh, yeah, I think we definitely have got better at dealing with it. I don't think particularly that the religion has the, the right answers. It's sort of, um, yes, particularly sort of Christianity, which says, you know, you're going to die. And at that point you will be judged. Um, and, and so you live your life with this kind of weird guilt, uh, of not knowing whether you've done enough or if you're, you're going to hell for eternity, if you're going to heaven, that's a weird, very a very cruel system, um, really cruel saying, you know, we're not going to tell you the rules properly, but if you get this wrong, then you are going to be in, in pain for all eternity. Um, which is quite a shocking thing that we have. And I'm sure if, you know, humans of the future will look back on that and see it as quite barbaric. Um, cause it's, it is quite psychologically, uh, terrible to tell a human that. Um, so yeah, I think we're getting better at dealing with it. Yeah. 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 For a lot of the theists I've debated and uh, talked to, this sense of cosmic courthouse in the next life where everything will be settled and the good will be rewarded, the evil will be punished. It feels like if that doesn't exist, then what? Hitler got away with it? That all the bad things that happen, it's just shit happens. That's just the way it goes. There's no cosmic settlement later. And, and that, I think, bothers a lot of people. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, they, they, they want to see. Yeah, because it shouldn't be for everyone, I guess, heaven, because there are terrible people on it. But it just kind of it, it undermines the whole system when you think that. Um, you know, in some faiths, if you repent for long enough, and if you're in pur- purgatory for long enough, then, then you wipe out your sins anyway. Um, so they really don't do get away with it. Um, yeah, it's 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 a really strange. I don't know how we, after all of humanity's evolution, and you know, we could have stumbled on any system to explain death, um, and we came up with that one, which is so, so punishing and so judgmental and so, <laughs> like, it's it's bizarre. Uh, I think I much prefer some, you know, the, the Buddhist uh, system of reincarnation, even though I, I don't believe in it. But it's a far more healthy way of looking at death, and that you know, in 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 that religion, you almost wanting to end the cycle you're in a constant cycle of of reincarnation but when you reach the uh you know a certain level of enlightenment then that cycle ends and so then you 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 put to rest which i think is a far more healthy way of looking at it Mm -hmm. yeah in addition to morals then uh, also meaning i think that a lot of people lean on that idea that if there isn't an afterlife and some sort of deity out there that kind of validates what we're doing here and now then what's the point Right, I call this Alvy's error. Alvy is Alvy Singer, Woody Allen's character in in uh, Annie Hall, in which he has that uh, flashback to his childhood where he refuses refuses to do his homework, and his mother takes him to the psychiatrist. And you know, Alvy, why won't you do your homework? Because the universe is expanding. <laughs> What's the universe got to do? Well, the universe is everything, and one day it's going to expand and all blow up, and so there's no point in my doing my homework. And his mother says, what's the universe got to do with it? We live in Brooklyn and Brooklyn's not expanding. <laughs> <laughs> and it's sort of that. I think a lot of theists, they live in that far future world that, that you know, that without, you know, if 15 billion years from now, if the universe ends or whatever it would be, then what I do tomorrow doesn't really matter. Yeah. And it's like, it doesn't matter. It matters now, tomorrow, to the people that you affect. Uh, I think it was William Lane Craig who made this argument that, you know, if... If if there's no afterlife in God, then what Hitler did to the Jews doesn't really matter. And it's like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It matters to the Jews. Yeah. 
and what they experienced it you know i mean what yeah yeah it's it almost has a reverse effect of that because you know if you don't think there is an afterlife and this is everything then everything we do has much more meaning in this in this existence right so um yeah i don't buy that that argument at all and i think it's i think it's one that people are sort of sort of seeing through as well um i yeah i have great faith in in younger generations than myself that uh you know they uh come through with the power you know of, of having the internet their entire lives and, and and hopefully as much damage as the internet will do overall the the, the benefit will be a, a sort of greater a greater education and, and a greater ability to challenge uh authority and 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 uh and long lasting ideas like the like those ones that's what I feel, but now I'm being pushed by people who think the internet maybe have been a bad thing. You know, the increase in depression and anxiety and the fear of missing out and all the polarization of politics because of social media and the Russian bots and blah, blah, and on it goes. I don't know. Maybe I'm just uh, too optimistic. How do you think about that? Yeah, I, th- I think I'm also an optimist. I think I think in the short term, certainly that argument can be made. Um, I think the internet... Personally, I think the internet got hijacked by the wrong people. Um, if you compare the way it was formed and, and the early pioneers of the internet and what their vision was, it was almost like, you know, this new world, this new digital world where anything was possible. Um, and like a lot of good things in our lives, it got it got hijacked by people that want to make money out of it um, and, and just commoditized, you know, our, our very, you know, actual humans through the internet. <laughs> And it's uh, and so in the short term, I agree with all those points that it's it's had some really drastic issues. But I think I'm I'm like you, I'm an optimist. I think if you look over a much longer time period, then we'll we'll realize that the internet is actually a, an incredible invention. Um, but we just maybe have to zoom out another another generation or, or four or five, and then then we'll see the the overall benefit. All right, Peter. Well, thank you for your work. Thank you for your book. Give us a kind of a final overview of the price of immortality. What is the price of immortality? I think the the price of immortality is a it, it's there's multiple there's multiple price points um, of immortality. Uh, one is not living your life um, and instead pursuing something which is quite possibly impossible, uh, quite probably impossible. Um, I think the price is also. Uh, creating a world in which we wouldn't want to live in anyway, um, particularly if it was a two-tiered world where only the people rich enough to live forever can live forever. Um, and, I, and I think the the final price could possibly be developing some kind of science along the way, which would really um, be used in the in the completely the wrong way, um, and actually make this make uh, people less likely to live longer and um, create more reason for us to kill each other. Mm, yeah right exactly all right so what are you working on next you must be uh thinking about your next book and what else you're interested in yeah i have there's a few topics sort of running i'm really interested in right now self-experimentation um i just wrote an article for 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 inverse on on people who who do self-experimentation now sort of biohackers um taking various things there was a big overlap with the immortality crowd um but I don't think anyone's written a book on self-experimentation for for a long time, sort of a history of it. Um, no. So I don't know much about that. What 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 is self-experimentation? You mean self-improvement? Uh, I, I mean, sort of taking a, a medicine or a, or a treatment and just using it on yourself before anybody has, has proved. Um, so oh, there's various oh, instances see, over time of like the guy, um, like like the guy who who invented LSD tried it on himself. Um, and it went on the world's first ever trip, essentially. Um, so um, there's all these characters through history who, who've just taken the ultimate leap and tried it on themselves. Um, and weirdly, I think that's become a sort of trend uh, where a lot of people are doing it now, and they call it obviously biohacking, um, of, of trying out different things to optimize their bodies. Was it Jenner that... Was it Jenner that uh, tried a vaccine on himself first or one of those early guys? Yeah, possibly, yeah. Yeah, there was a vaccine. The One of the famous ones was the H. pylori guy who drank the solution that came, contained the bacteria oh, right. to prove that that caused stomach ulcers. 
um, yeah, I think it was Albert Hoffman that right. did LSD. Um, there's a, there's a few of them. Right. There, was a, there was a dentist who who knocked himself out, I think, um, to prove uh, something. Mm. <laughs> but it's all these. Mm. There's a lot of sort of crazy characters just made the ultimate sort of moves. So, so yeah, I, I'm looking into that. That, that could be interesting. Um, otherwise, possible. Oh, that would make a great book. Yeah, no, I've not seen anything about any books along that line. Yeah. Those lines. It would be almost like kind of a pre-science. Like these are the stages that you, you go through before you actually run con- randomized controlled trials or, or something more official like that. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of people are trying it today. So it's it, it would have a sort of uh, a modern angle as well. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of modeling it over. I'm not sure if I'm ready to dive into a, another big project uh, having not long sort of finish this one but yeah i'll soon get bored and then have to do something so <laughs> that's one of the See, ideas because uh y- your your immortality is pending in decades to yeah. come so you have to write some more books to create your legacy yeah exactly <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> all right peter thanks thanks for talking to me on the show and thanks for your book i love the book and uh, 